Good morning. It's great to be back together again and not either sitting in my office or standing up here without any of you guys here. Um, it's been a while, hasn't it? Um, because we're recording it, we're going to do things a little differently. I'll read all the scriptures just because hopefully the phone will pick up the magnified voice. I uh, still want you to ask questions or if you have comments or whatever, sometimes I'll repeat them, sometimes I won't. Um, and we'll see how this works and then we'll adjust uh, next week. So let's just jump right into the lesson. We're on lesson 12. One of the things that constantly amazes me is how Bible lessons can seamlessly fit into current events. Um, one of the ideas in today's lesson is that Christians should submit to government authority. And David and I were talking about this uh, earlier this week. He goes, this may not be a good time to do this. And I said, no, I think it's the perfect time, right? Uh, we've had a tumultuous two weeks since George Floyd's death. Uh, depending on who you talk to, the police force and our government is either good or not so good slash evil, right? And let's be honest, at, all, at one point or another in our lives, we probably thought the government was a little too intrusive, right, on our, on our lives. I know when I re write that check every April, I don't have a lot of I really don't, sorry. Um, and never mind if you're pulled over by a police officer for a burned out tail light, or heaven forbid you're speeding, it's easy to think, don't you have something better to do? Uh, in today's lesson, Paul deals with believers' relationship to governing authorities. That is the same as this. This is more for the folks on video. You guys keep me synced. If I start talking about something that doesn't make sense, then that means the slides are out of order. Um, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 21 from last week's lesson form really kind of bookends for the last part of chapter 12. Paul says, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Today's lesson, Paul develops three concrete ways for Roman believers to do good and avoid evil, which can be summarized by three words. Submit, love, and anticipate. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. In verse 1, Paul shifts from a series of commands that he had in, in 12 about do these things to a single topic of the believer's relationship to governmental authorities. Quote, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Paul's saying that submission to the government authorities is one of the good things that Roman believers were supposed to do and cling to. When Paul wrote to Titus in Crete, he told him to remind the churches to, quote, be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. And Paul's not the only apostle to argue for submission to authorities. 1 Peter 2, verse 13 and 14, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Peter specifically exhorted believers to submit to the authorities, even saying, quote, honor the emperor in verse 17. These had to be difficult or at the very least surprising words for um, Roman believers to hear, right? During this time, the Roman Empire uh, was at the end of what's called Pax Romana, or Roman peace. For almost 200 years before the current Emperor Nero, the empire had been extremely cohesive. It was helped by a degree of social stability and economic prosperity that Rome had never before experienced. There weren't nearly as many wars, 
and any uprisings that had occurred were swiftly and mercilessly put down. But by the time Nero took the throne in 54 AD, the empire had already reached its zenith and started a steady downward spiral. Dio Cassius, a contemporary Greek historian, coined a famous quote saying that Rome had descended, quote, from a kingdom of gold to one of rust and iron. It was decaying from the inside out. Beginning in 69 AD, following Nero's death, there were tumultuous years ahead, including one year when there were four emperors. So a lot of strife, a lot of civil war, uh, you know, just a, a terrible time. And as we know from history, soon after Paul wrote his letter to Roman Christians, Nero would begin a terrible and widespread persecution of the Christians in Rome. I'm sure many people probably saw this coming or heard rumors about it or whatever and might have wondered why they should submit to Rome's rule. For anyone that knows of Jesus' healing, healing teachings shouldn't be a surprise, right? Paul and Peter's instructions echo Jesus' instruction to the Pharisees and Herodians in Mark chapter 12. We talked about that last week. They were testing Jesus, asking if Jews should pay taxes to Caesar. Mark chapter 12, verse 17, Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Submitting to authority also shouldn't be a surprise because submission to authority was part of the Old Testament as well. What's the first authority that you deal with as a child, as a young child, infant? Yeah. Mom and dad, right? If you're like almost anybody, mom and dad are the first authority you run into. The fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you. We're to honor and obey our parents, the authority of our parents. Also, if you remember one of the many times that Paul was trying to kill David, David had the opportunity to kill Saul while he was resting in a cave. Does everybody remember that story? Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. So even though Paul had tried to kill him multiple times, David wouldn't raise his hand against the anointed king of Israel because he was the authority. Paul says, be subject to every human institution. What does being subject to authority mean? Yeah, submitting yourself. You're, you're placing yourself in a subordinate relationship to someone or something, right? You, you, you are not completely at free will. Your will is based on somebody else. Paul gave two reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities, one general and one very specific. First, he says in verse 1, quote, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul says there's no authority outside the scope of God's authority. In other words, all authority on heaven and earth is subordinate to God. Paul gives us the second reason in verse 2. He says, quote, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. The King James Version says the powers that be are, are ordained of God. The powers that be are ordained. So God ordains earthly governing authorities. That, I have, I mean, that's why I can't talk to They have trouble with that. Right? When I think about China or Iran or Russia, these you know, totalitarian, authoritarian regimes, why would God put you know, Christians under that type of thing? But then again, Rome wasn't exactly a benevolent regime, right? And yet Peter told Christians to honor the emperor who thought himself a god. Even though we don't understand it, and it's a difficult thing to grasp, we have to trust that there's a greater purpose at work for everything God does or allows. That's the only thing I could come up with. Anybody else have any ideas? <laughs>
When Jesus was in front of Pilate on the last day, and Pilate claimed to have authority over him, he said, I have the authority to do this or that or have you crucified. Jesus answered, quote, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. If we accept that God ordains governing authorities, the logical conclusion must be that those who oppose the authority are opposing God's ordinance. Once again, that's an easy submission when the authority is benevolent, but what if it's not? If you ask most of us in the room, we'd say that local police are a benevolent authority. If you ask a large number of blacks the same question, especially after we've been the last few weeks, they would probably overwhelmingly disagree with you, right? It seems to me that our obligation to submit to governing authorities ends when we're told by the government to do something that is against our faith, or we're told not to do something that our faith requires. And at that point, we're released from that. Paul also says, quote, those who resist will incur judgment. It's not completely clear whether Paul is talking about judgment from God or judgment from the government, but it's clear that judgment will come. Romans uh, verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. <clears throat> Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Verse 3, Paul gives us another reason for believers to submit. Not only did God ordain the governmental structures that exist, he has given them the task of maintaining order in society. Paul says, quote, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. In a perfect world, people who refrain from going against authority and do what's good have nothing to fear from rulers. Paul says that good conduct is the antidote for fear of authorities and may, in fact, lead to positive recognition by the authorities. Paul offers another reason for believers to submit. He says, quote, for, it is, for he is God's servant for your good. Not only did God ordain the governmental structures that exist, he's given these people in authority the task of maintaining order in society. Paul says twice that rulers are, quote, servants of God. Paul normally used the Greek word translated servant to refer to Christian leaders, but here it's clearly something different. We also see that this same Greek word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to refer to the king's attendants in the book of Esther. In addition, both Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, who were pagan kings, right? They're not Israelites, are described using the same Greek word, servant. That brings us to Paul's second point about the role of authorities. He says, but if you do wrong, be afraid. And then later the verse, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Paul had earlier reassured his readers they had nothing to fear from gathering authorities as long as their conduct was proper. However, if their behavior was bad, they had every reason to be afraid. Paul also says, quote, for he does not bear the sword in vain. That refers to the government's ability to punish those who break the law. And in Paul's day, in the Roman Empire, that many times led to the death penalty, many times being beheaded. Just as rulers were God's servants for good, they can also be God's servants for vengeance. In this world, the ruler was the avenger that carried out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. A prime example of this brings us back to Nebuchadnezzar, who the Bible says was God's servant. When the Israelites didn't listen to the prophet Jeremiah, God punished the Israelites. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, because you have not obeyed my words, Behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these surrounding nations. <clears throat> I will devote them to destruction, and make them a horror, 
hissing and an everlasting devastation. In this case, Nebuchadnezzar was the avenger of God who carried out the wrath on the Israelites. If you don't remember the story, the Israelites were carried off into captivity and spent 70 years in Babylon. Verses 5 through 7. Therefore, one must be in subjugation, not only to God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authority of the ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. In verse 5, Paul summarizes the instructions he's just giving by reiterating that believers were to be subject to rulers, and he gives two more reasons. First, he says, quote, not only to avoid God's wrath, which parallels the ruler's role in punishing those who do wrong, refusal to submit to this legitimate function of government will certainly bring punishment, either earthly or judgment of God. Secondly, Paul says, quote, also for the sake of conscience. For the Christian, conscience is moral sensitivity to the will and purpose of God. It's tied to the believer's transformed mind that seeks to understand the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. To paraphrase, Paul urged believers to submit because it's the right thing to do, and we know it from our conscience. In verse 6, Paul says, For because of this you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God. For the third time, Paul says their authorities are servants, or in this case, ministers of God. The change from using the word servants to ministers appears to be more stylistic than anything else. It doesn't change the, the actual meaning. Paul summarized this discussion of the believer's relationship to government authorities using the language of debt. Everybody understood debt, right? I owe this guy, he owes me. He says, quote, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. Because of the authority's role as servants of God, believers had an obligation that needs to be paid. The obligation is summarized with four categories. Taxes that are owed directly, revenue or indirect taxes or fees, maybe you have a fee for building a new building or whatever, respect and honor. We are supposed to willingly fulfill our obligations as citizens. Government shouldn't be a nuisance to, to be avoided whenever possible, but rather an institution created by God to serve its people. Government authorities, including the police when they pull you over for speeding, deserve the respect and honor due them as God's servants. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that we should give thanks for governing authorities and pray for them. That doesn't mean our obedience is absolute, as we've already talked about. Absolute authority belongs only to God, and believers must always evaluate the demands of earthly authorities in light of the Gospels. Next, we're going to talk about love. We're going to shift focus. Verses 8 through 10. Oh, no one, anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul ties verse 8 to the previous section by continuing the concept of debt. He says, quote, owe no one anything. Believers are to repay all obligations so they do not owe anything to anyone. But he left one exception open, saying, except to love each other. Loving each other is an obligation that can never be fully repaid. It's a debt that we can never pay. Paul uses the word each other. Some Bible teachers point to Paul's normal use of one another and conclude he's talking about only loving other believers. But in verse 9, Paul's going to talk about neighbors, and that recalls the parable of the Good Samaritan and Jesus' definition of neighbor, which was everyone, right? 
In that case, this debt of love is owed to both believers and non-believers, even the ones that might be hostile toward us. Paul says we have an obligation to love because, quote, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This concept is obviously important to Paul as he repeats this at the end of verse 10. To drive home his point that love for another fulfills the law, Paul quotes four commandments that deal with the way believers should relate to one another. He quotes, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. He also says, and any other commandment, probably referring to any commandment that deals with social interaction between people. Paul says that all these commandments, quote, are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This command is found in both the Old Testament and the New. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> Matthew 36, uh, verse 38, or 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Both Leviticus and Matthew tell us to love your neighbor as yourself. There's a reason why this simple adage sums up all the other commandments. If you truly love your neighbor, you would never do him any harm, right? Instead, you'll try to do what's good for your neighbor. And at the close of the verse, Paul once again reminds us that, quote, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now we're going to turn to anticipate. Verse 11. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Earlier in chapter 6, Paul urged the Roman church to look at the present in view of the past, specifically the death and resurrection of Jesus. In verse 11, he urges them to look at the present in the view of the future, Jesus' second coming. For us, it's been almost 2,000 years since the crucifixion. It's a distant thing. But for Paul and the others, it was within their lifetime. It was a recent memory. I have to think that they anticipated that Jesus would return at any time. No one knows when Jesus will return. But one thing we know for sure is that it's a certainty. As a result, Paul urged his audience to remain steady for his return, using the imagery of someone who was being roused from a deep sleep. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Paul used the same energy in addressing the believers in Thessalonica. First Thessalonica chapter 5 or 6. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. While we're uncertain about when Jesus will return, there's an absolute certainty that he will return. Paul says, quote, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. He assured the Roman believers that salvation is nearer now than yesterday. Every day is one day closer to Jesus' return. Verses 12 and 13. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Paul continued the imagery of sleep by saying, quote, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. What do you think that means? night is far gone. Early morning. Yeah, it's getting ready to be sun up, right? The, the, the night's almost over, the day is at hand. For anybody that's ever been deer hunting, you, you want to get in the stand when it's still dark, right? But sometimes you misjudge how long it's going to take you to get there. Maybe you're dropping somebody else off, and you get there really early. And you're sitting there in the dark, shivering with your breath clouding up around your face and you're wondering is the sun ever going to come up right you know the day is coming you just don't know when paul used the same imagery of a new day in his first letter saying in first john chapter 2 because the darkness is passing away 
and the true light is already shining. Having described the time in which they live, Paul moves to exhort them about how to live during that time. Quote, let us cast off the works of darkness and put, our, put on the armor of light. He cleverly uses the analogy of changing clothes, taking off one set and putting on another. What we're to discard with the old set of clothes are the works of darkness, the activities of our old life prior to coming to Christ. <coughs> he outlines a representative list in verse 13 we'll talk about later, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Paul commands us to, quote, put on the armor of light. The Greek word is translated armor there, sometimes referred to a tool of war, like a weapon, but most of the time referred to garments that you put on to protect yourself in battle, right? really thick things or metal things where if a spear or a sword hits you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cut you. One thing's for sure, if you just crawl out of bed, it's likely that your bedclothes wouldn't be appropriate to take into battle, right? <laughs> you need to prepare yourself with the right clothes and weapons. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul talks about Christians who are, quote, children of light, children of the day. As such, we need armor of light and not the works of darkness. Verse 13, Paul says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. There are many examples in the New Testament where authors use the image of walking as a way to describe the believer's lifestyle. Here, the Christian lifestyle is described positively by two phrases. First, believers are to walk properly. The Greek word translated properly refers to behavior that is proper or appropriate. And second, believers were to behave as in the daytime. We've already said that Christians are children of light and should live in the light as opposed to the darkness. Paul used three pairs of words to show what deeds of darkness look like. The first two pairs may have been chosen because they're commonly carried out in darkness. The first, Orgies and drunkenness refers to excessive drinking and partying. I had to kind of look this up because you've got orgies and drunkenness and then you've got sexual immorality. It seems like there was be some sexual immorality involved with orgies. So I went back and that word that's translated orgies uh, is actually rioting in the King James Version. And it means the concepts of rioting and revelry kind of mixed together, usually involving a nocturnal procession half-drunken people who parade through the streets with torches, singing and playing instruments until into the wee hours at night. So that was the origins. The second pair of sexual immorality and sensuality, which I would think might occur after the procession that just ended, but uh, and although these are not exclusively nighttime activities, they're more frequently carried out at night. Why do you think more immoral things happen after darkness? Yeah. Don't recognize them. Yeah. Right, right. One, I'm less likely to get caught. Right. And two, inherently, I know I'm doing bad, so I don't really anybody want. I don't really want anybody watching me. You know, it's that whole moral conscious thing that everybody has. And they're drunk. And they're drunk. The third pair, quarreling and jealousy, are a little out of place, and they may have been chosen because Paul is going to talk about conflict between weak and strong believers in the next chapter. We think he's alluding to that. <clears throat> Final verse, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In verse 14, Paul returns to the language of clothing that he used in verse 12. Here, instead of putting on armor, Paul charged believers to quote, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Although Paul used the words put on frequently, the only other time he told believers that they were clothed with Christ was when he was addressing the Galatian Christians concerning baptism. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul says, quote, For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Paul already said in Romans chapter 2 that believers are to embrace Christ to the point that they are transformed in his likeness by the renewing of their minds. Paul finishes verse 14 by saying, quote, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is similar to Paul's instruction to Galatian Christians to walk 
in this spirit so they would, quote, not gratify the desires of the flesh. Since the desires of the flesh are opposed to the desires of the spirit, we need to be opposed to the desires of the flesh. In today's lesson, Paul tells us to submit, love, and anticipate. Submit to earthly authority because authority is ordained by God. Love is a debt that we can never repay. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And finally, we're to anticipate Christ's return and put on our armor of light and walk in the day. Next week, we are on to chapter 13, lucky 13. Uh, it is Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And the theme for next week's lesson is believers should accept and encourage other believers to facilitate unity. Any comments? Pretty quiet today. I guess nobody wants to be on camera. Timely lesson. Sorry? It was a timely lesson. It really was. Um, uh, Microsoft is a West Coast company. They're very socially conscious. And I probably spent seven hours over the last two weeks in meetings where, you know, African Americans can share how they feel or how they instruct their children. Uh, like one was telling me personally, it wasn't part of the meeting, that she's told her sons um, to only wear a blue mask. Don't wear like a black one or a something with a face on it or whatever, because she doesn't want any confusion that they're there to rob instead of just being socially conscious. So it, it's an enlightening time. It, it really is. Uh, next week, if this works, we'll try this again for those that can't attend. Uh, that way we won't have to record it twice. And um, let's pray out of here. Father God, thank you for the ability to meet together again and see each other in fellowship. We ask that you keep everyone safe during our opening up from this coronavirus scare. We'd ask that you be with our church and our church staff. Keep them safe. Help us to be good examples in our communities and bring us back next week safely. Christ.